What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of At Home with Mark. Today, season four, episode 22. And holy cow, I'm so happy because I have the man, the myth, the legend, the king of Steely Dan transcriptions, Mr. <laughs> Mick Taylor. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, Mick. Of course, Mark. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, I, I helped Dan when he did his. So uh, I thought, yeah, it would be good to do that as well. Yeah, man. I'm so happy to have had both of you on here because I've been a huge fan of both of you guys for a really, really long time, man. I've been watching the show and I've probably learned more about my own gear because of you guys than of any other <laughs> outlet I've ever had. Honestly, man, for real. So that's good. That's good to hear. It's funny, you know, because on the show, we, um, sometimes you can assume you're talking to one person but every pro tech we meet they're like oh i watched the show We're like really oh, yeah i actually learned stuff as well, well no way no way so uh, yeah, man. Cool. I'm th thanks for saying that you guys are like the perfect yin and yang with with specific things in terms of like the knowledge that you bring to it too so i think it, you guys balance each other so well off you like working off of each other that's what makes it so engaging and obviously you guys are really wonderful people so it's fun to watch you guys but like <laughs> I have learned a lot, man. So I appreciate you guys for that. Um, oh, cool. Cool. <laughs> Mick, so, dude, I wanted to, like, hear more about your story because I don't know a ton about your history other than, like, you know, guitarist and stuff like that. So I want to talk a little bit about journalism and how you got into all that stuff, too. Cool. Um, but I do want to know, like, what what's your, like, earliest musical memory? It's funny. The actual memory, you know how you have... Uh, photographs pictures of when you were a kid and they turn into memories because they were photographs yeah so whether it's an actual memory or whether it's a photograph that stirs it the the story goes i was about two years old and my dad uh he's how old is he now he's 78 years old now and he still plays the guitar and sings and he played the guitar and sung then so there were always guitars in the house or a guitar should i say and uh they got me one of those plastic ukulele things and bear in mind this is 1976 so it wasn't like a flying v-shaped one or a sunburst les paul one it was you know a, a cheap plastic ukulele and apparently elvis was on the radio and i was getting hugely irate because the thing wasn't in tune and i smashed it to pieces and they got me another one <laughs> spoiled kid right they got me another one and my dad worked out that he could tune it and if he tuned it to a chord that was resonant with whatever the song was on the radio or the song he was playing i didn't smash it <laughs> oh man so that's two years old so whether i don't know if i remember that or whether i remember the the picture um i think my first actual musical memory would have been um they bought me a K S G copy with a bolt on neck. And uh, I don't know if any of you guys remember this. There was a, a plastic bodied amplifier that was about that big and it had an oval speaker that came with the guitar. And that was a K brand as well. It's like a piece of junk plastic thing, but I was eight years old. So it was the best thing in the world. Anyway, my teacher at school really encouraged me to take that into school and play it in front of the school in front of the class and i played i think it was either smoke on the water or a status quo song because i was into both and i remember everything changing from that moment because Man. even at, even at eight years old i could see that people were interested in this thing even kids in a classroom were like that's different so oh. i think that's probably my earliest actual memory that's crazy, Mick. Hey, can, uh, people are saying, can you bring up your volume just a tiny bit? I can hear you mm. fine, but I, I think some people through the internet are not hearing it. And, and while you're doing that, I, I find it so fascinating, man, how many people like I've talked to that touch the guitar that young. Because for me, I didn't, I didn't touch a guitar until like seventh grade. So I was probably 12. Um going on 13 you know like i was much older i feel like but to have that part of you that young that is it's just fascinating like and then honestly like so your dad you say your dad still plays but like did you like study under your dad a little bit like showed you like 
first position chords and things like that? Not really. Um, I, let us know if the audio is any better. I've put it up a little bit. Um, not really. My dad, um, he just, he knew first position open chords and he was not, he's never been a confident guitar player. I think the, the, where it, around that time when I was eight years old, I uh, um, had an older friend called Matthew Smith who lived in the village and his brother, Kevin Smith, <laughs> yeah. who, would have been, who, who would have been in his teens, I guess, he got a Fender Strat. And when I was eight years old, to have a Fender Strat in our village was like, it may as well have been a Rolls Royce. Because they just didn't exist back then. People didn't have Fender Strats. Yeah. And I can remember going around to his house, going around to Matthew's house. Matthew played the drums and his brother played the guitar and they played in this band called Distortion. And he would he would do that thing where, you know, it'd be in his bedroom and the case would be on the floor and he'd go, you can look at it. And he literally opens the case and you're like, oh, and the, you know, the lights come out and the angels start singing. And, uh, and that was it. And it was a black um, early 80s strap with a maple board, big headstock. And, um, and, and that was it. So, so via Matthew, who was the drummer, his brother, Kevin. And then I, I just don't remember how it started, but it just started. My brother too, I should say, he played drums um, we lived in this tiny house in the tiny village in the middle of nowhere and his mates would all turn up, set up drum kits and guitars and amps. So I guess it was, it was all around in a sort of teenage frisson of the next, you know, people that were six or seven years older than me were all doing it. So of course I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Uh, I think yeah. that's where it kicked off. It is the coolest thing in the world. Let's be real. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. No <laughs> So let's talk about let's talk about records. Let's talk about yep. early early records and stuff because you and I are kind of cut from the same cloth in terms of that's why I think I identify with the show so much especially with like cuz I'm a strat guy. I've always been a strat guy. I bought a studio signature as a midlife crisis uh, cuz I always wanted a two rock and now I'm upgrading. I've been talking to Eli about upgrading to a Bloomfield. So it's like we're kind of in the same elements of like digging funk and jazz and blues and all that stuff. So like early on, was it more like me where it was like rock and roll, like, you know, ACDC yeah. name all of them. You know what I mean? Was it like that for you too? Yeah, it was. Um, and that was partly down to this guy, Matthew Smith and his brother, Kevin, because in their band distortion, they played uh quo status quo, I don't know if Status Quo were the, in the States what they were here. They were they were just a massively influential rock band. And I still credit them with any sense of rhythm I have to this day. I, I credit fully to um, Francis Rossi and Rick Parfit. And so Quo, definitely, they played a bit of ACDC. They played um, UFO uh, and they played um, Richie Blackmore, uh, Deep Purple. Nice. Funnily enough, we're doing some gigs this week. And I can't even believe I'm saying this with Andy Timmons <laughs> and That's one awesome. of the tracks, one of the tracks we're going to play at the end is um, Black Knight. Oh, nice. And I swear to you, when I'm eight years old, stood there watching my, bro my friend's brother's band distortion play Black Knight, I can still hear them playing it. And when we're doing that on Thursday night and Saturday night, I'm going to be like, Oh my God, I'm eight years old again. So uh, <laughs> sorry, a bit of a tangent, but yeah, um, it was definitely rock early doors uh and acdc in a big way in a huge way okay so uh, and quo uh, you know really really quo because my dad um i hope he won't mind me saying this hates any music that's not country and western <laughs> um it, uh, unless it's like hard electric blues and he doesn't mind that but right. anything else junk <laughs> <laughs> what's funny about that too because i don't I'm not a country guy. I just am not like I appreciate it, like deeply appreciate it. My uncle is a bluegrass dobro player. He's a killing like dobro player, but um, it just never spoke to me that the way that the electric guitar spoke to me. Um, and I talk about this all the time, Nick. I mean, I we're not too far off in age. I mean, I, I just turned forty three, um, but I started playing guitar because of Pearl Jam. So yeah, like right. I heard the first time I heard that, I mean, I just got a tattoo, my first tattoo the other day, uh, like a couple weeks ago, because I was like, it's time. It's time for me to like put my, why I'm a, uh, I'm a guitarist. It's the stick man from Pearl Jam and it's a, a yield sign, which is my yes. favorite album. Okay. So, you know, of Pearl Jam's, but like it, it's, 
it's funny how that morphed and changed into when I got to college, I was more into like improvisational music. And I was like, oh, now I have to understand how this works. Did you go through that phase too? Like when did that happen? Like when? No, didn't really? never. I've never been interested in jazz or improvisational music or anything like that. Don't get me wrong. I've listened to my fair share of Wayne Krantz and Osnoy and um, I'm a, I can't say I'm a big Frank Zappa fan. I love Frank Zappa. So I, I'm not massively knowledgeable of his catalog given that it's you know <laughs> voluminous right. voluminous but i do love frank zappa so it's not like i don't like out there music for want of a better word and i love um you know uh bebop era jazz i uh, uh, and certainly you know birth of cool and miles davis and john coltrane and um i, I definitely still listen to that stuff all the time but it, like straight improvisational um I don't know what you would call it. But then, I don't know, I listened to Mike Stern, listened to jo John Schofield. I think it was less about genre for me and more about guitar players. Mm -hmm. um, but so what happened was, you know, from the rock thing, I then got into blues and Stevie Ray Vaughan hit me about age 13 like a freight train because my dad used to take me down the pub to watch the bands that were coming through. And there was a guy that came through and I, I i just remember it as clear as day he played uh he had a red strat a fender concert 410 and i think he had a tube screamer and they played this absolutely bonkers version of t-bone shuffle which uh as it turns out was essentially the version of the showdown record with robert cray and albert collins and johnny copeland and that was like an era defining turnaround no more rock it was high octane strat blues for me and that guy is a guy called Marco Rossi, who uh, is still living in, in Weymouth in the, in the town that he came from. And I got to meet him and become friends with him a bit later in life. And uh, that was the minute it turned to blues. And then what you're saying. So uh, when 10 came out was what, 91, 90, 91? 91. Yeah. So I was 16, 17, you know, I was as essentially, if you'll forgive the term, as fertile as one can possibly be for kind of getting Im immersed in music and finding freedom and doing all of that 10 came out uh blood sugar sex magic came out i discovered Soundgarden, um that whole movement and i kind of sort of circled back around to rock again and somewhere in the middle of, of all of that stevie ray vaughan landed so it was this weird and the weird thing about stevie ray and pearl jam and john frusciante those three triangulated hendrix for me perfectly yeah, because Frisanti obviously on Blood Sugar Sex Magic could have been Hendrix in a, in a few of those tracks. Yep. Um, Mike McCready obviously Univibe, Strat, Marshall could be Hendrix, and Stevie Ray obviously had done the Voodoo Child. So it's this sort of meandering route through rock and blues rock, mm -hmm. and kind mm -hmm. of that's that's how it, it it shaped into that. So within that, I didn't get pulled off to um really think too heavily about well technique guitar was a big thing at the time so through the late 80s and early 90s passion and warfare i can't remember what year that came out but i remember listening to passion and warfare going oh no <laughs> that's it it's all over <laughs> yeah. does anyone anyone do this i went out and bought an rg550 um waited four months for it to turn up kept it for two weeks and sent it back <laughs> so had a brief dalliance with that you know like a two-week dalliance with trying to play the guitar like like that which right. i just don't understand and i still don't understand so either, the, the idea of heavy improvis improvisational Im sorry i'm trying to say it like you <laughs> improvisational <laughs> music um i just i didn't quite get there with guitar because i to this day i'm still just trying to play the note you know the one note that goes ah yeah <laughs> Yep, dude. I, and, you know, I think that's the thing. It's so nice, too, to have like grow up with siblings that can expose you to stuff, too, because I do owe a lot to my older brother. My older brother yeah. exposed me to the Grateful Dead. And that's that's mostly where I live with the improvisational stuff is like understanding what Jerry Garcia was doing and not really yeah. truly appreciating it as a young player in terms of how I look at it now. Yeah. Like he's like he's playing the changes so well. Like if you. You listen to a song like Brown Eyed Women, for instance, that's that's an interesting chord progression. And like if you listen to Jerry solo over it, you're like, oh, like 
he's like a jazzer in a way. Like he's playing the changes really, really well. So that's mostly where I'm coming from with the improvisational stuff. Although I dude, Wayne Krantz is one of my favorite guitarists on planet earth. So, yeah, I, you know, I think a lot of that generation of players learned properly, didn't they? Yeah. Um, and certainly of that era, you know, if they were in their mid adulthood in the, in the seventies, they probably quite a few of them probably learned guitar properly. And they did learn the chords and they did learn the changes and they did learn melody because that I, I suppose that's how guitar was was taught if it was taught in a sort of formal sense. And then everyone else just got rock and roll, didn't they? They were like, I don't need to do all of that. And that reaction against having to do that. And that's in a way, I guess, how rock and roll was born. And the mirror of that in the UK, and I know it happened in the US as well, but would have been punk. So my brother, eight years older than me, his... Uh, teens were entirely different from mine. Like my teens were in the eighties, uh, age of affluence, age of crazy produced music. Um, you know, stockbrokers were on brick phones and all that. Not that <laughs> I was exposed to any of that, but the eighties was all about that. Right. My brother, you know, his formative years were grim Britain in the seventies, mm. high unemployment, massive inflation, really low job prospects and what was the reaction to that it was punk it was the pistols and it was i don't know his favorite band ever in the whole world is the ramones so we were we were sort of diametrically opposed in in terms of music but in the spirit of doing it and performing and being connected with it it was exactly the same thing um yeah so i i i, I have a lot to thank him for for sure yeah it's such an amazing i mean there's there's probably bands that you probably have friends who have exposed you to stuff that changed your life along the way too. You know, like there's a ton of, I, I went to Berkeley after I already had an undergraduate degree. Right. So like I went there when I was 28. So I had a very open mind and I was very keen to study and work hard, which if I would have went there when I was 17, I don't think I would have had the same experience to be honest. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. But, but I had two professors that changed my life just by playing me um two different records like the first time i heard d'angelo's voodoo i was like holy <laughs> crap what is this and i was so late to the game you know yeah. um and then johnny lang's turnaround you know that record yeah oh yeah. my god oh that album fundamentally changed the way that i think about blues rock at that time that it, oh i find that so interesting because i i wonder if it could have been any record that you were just particularly open at that point. Maybe. And I've often wondered about this because I have records that are, that, that are, are pivotal moments in the same way. And I just wonder if you just receptors are a little more open on that particular day at that time. And it's something sinks in that could have sunk in from another record, but it, it happens to be that one. Interestingly enough, I met Johnny Lang just when he broke, he was 16, I think. And uh, he came in and was interviewed by the mag. And it was, it was a weird thing, you know, for, I was pretty young at the time, I don't know, 22, 23, something like that. And to meet this 16 year old kid who was like way more mature, an infinitely better guitar player, a singer, <laughs> like if you listen to the record, you just swore he was 50. Yeah. <laughs> and, and smoked 50 cigs a day. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember him. I remember him fondly, actually. Yeah. Yeah. He's the thing about that record, I think that really hit me and you're probably right. I want to hear what your pivotal record was, which you were just mentioning. But the thing about that record that really stands out to me with him is how much better his voice got. His voice has gotten is improved over the years so much. I feel like in the beginning, if you watch like the Blues Brothers 2000 movie or whatever that was, he was it's almost like he was just screaming a bit yeah. in that. But yeah, if you yeah. listen to that album, man, he's like an R&B singer. He's like a neo soul type of a blues guy you know <laughs> it's everybody should check out that album it's called turnaround it's amazing turn around okay i'm gonna listen yeah. to that yeah so i'm a big i am i am actually a big fan of of uh all that neo soul stuff as well i mean yeah. on a sort of slightly more watered down level here in the uk it, it got opened up a little bit by the brand new heavies which were pretty cool killer trumpet solo on one of those records and endia davenport the singer was just this unbelievable singer but then yeah d'angelo for sure um and even some of the gangster rap stuff you know going through uni listening to warren g and <laughs> and all that stuff but i think they all they were all drawing from the same place and putting it out in a different way 
and i think that you know that history of of black music i guess you would call it through through blues through soul through rap and through new soul has it's just tied so inextricably with the kind of groove i like with the kind of rhythm i like with the kind of melody and harmony i like um but especially the grooves the way it's always back the way it's always swung um yeah yeah i'm i'm a huge fan of that a massive fan and i think that's why i never went much further with the rock thing cuz rock just always seemed too on for me it was always everything was always too on it always felt like it was speeding up whereas the music i like the blues and the soul just sat back and i still to this day i'm more of a fan of that stuff when you write music like if you're writing original music do you feel like it comes from a groove for you like when you're writing stuff guitar wise even even if you're writing a part with you know if someone calls you to do a hit or something like that does it come from more of a groove um birthplace do you feel yeah i i mean I, as a guitar player i have a very narrow kind of um area of usefulness as it were i mean i can i can do other things but really there's only that i mean i don't do a lot of session work or anything um and so stepping too far out of that i find i find difficult obviously anyone who's half a guitar player can mimic most things but doing it with some sort of integrity and feel and conviction is quite hard and it is interesting because i think the music you like and the music you love to listen to and the music you love to jam along to and maybe even play in your cover band and those that's the majority of gigs i do um might i i'm not i'm not always sure that it's the kind of music that's that would come out if you if you wrote music so the other genre of music i love in a big way is singer songwriter so um oh, where do you even begin james taylor tim buckley um all this, some of the more contemporary uh, americana people like um Aoife o'donovan um like uh, sarah jaros yeah i am mad for that stuff and i'm far more likely to be listening to that than i am any rock or blues these days so right. it, I mean, right all the way up. I mean, it, it gets as commercial as Taylor Swift and Maren Morris. You know, I'm a massive fan of that stuff, partly from a production point of view, but also I think the songwriting is utter genius. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that pop songwriting is just, I mean, it's, it's proper genius, especially Taylor Swift. And um, so I, I'm more likely to be listening to that now than I am heavy guitar music because, I don't know, maybe maybe you go in and out of it maybe i think so but writing wise um i don't know it i've never been a confident writer and i think it comes out as an amalgam of influences so it'll always sound a bit like them or a bit like that funnily enough I was listening to a record the other day um trying to identify who the guitar player was and i couldn't identify them instantly turns out it was sean tubbs um, ah. and he was playing on david cross oh i lost oh there you go. i lost you for a second mick Oh, am I back? Yeah, you're back. You said, you say David Crosby? It was a David Crosby? David Crosby record, yeah. And wow. uh, apparently, apparently it was Sean Tubbs playing guitar on it. I couldn't quite pick him out. You know, if and that's the thing. If it was Landau or if it was, I don't know, a couple of, if it was Lukather, for example, not that it would be on a Crosby record, but it might have been Landau, you'd know instantly. You'd know like from three or four notes if it was them. And I, I guess I've always wanted to be that player rather than the one who could do everything mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and <laughs> as it turns out i fall deeply between both stools <laughs> <laughs> i think i think it's funny because like when i hear you play on the show and stuff you both have a fingerprint mm. like you know what i mean like and not not to say like if the if the screen was black and it was like who's playing mick or dan it's pretty obvious because yeah, you guys do yeah. have a yeah. fingerprint but I hear, I do hear your influences come out in you. But I think you got your own voice, man. Like I think, yeah. I, doing, I mean, you know? I think anyone who's been playing a little while hopefully can relate to that. It 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 comes with a bit of confidence where you go, actually, yeah, it's okay. I can I can just do this. I, certainly from the early days of that pedal show, you know, as anyone who's ever tried to make a video and put it on the internet will know, it's nerve wracking, man, because. 
I mean, yeah, okay, it's your choice to go, hey, I'm going to go on the internet, watch me on the internet. <laughs> we're, we're, all, we're all deeply narcissistic somewhere, somewhere down in there. But um, then, the, you know, then the comments co co start coming back. It's like, you're the worst guitar player I've ever heard. <laughs> right. um, um, you know, take up something else, you know, all, the, all those comments that start coming back. And you go through a period of self-reflection there where you go, actually, maybe I'm really not good enough to do this. And then you come out the other side of that going, you know what? If you do what's true to you and you stay to doing what's true to you and you somehow find it in yourself to do it from the heart, it then doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how good, bad or otherwise you are in other people's minds, because if you're doing it from a place of personal integrity and personal desire to do it, I think it's OK. I think it's fine then. And I don't worry about that anymore, which is why I think my playing stays a bit more bracketed than Dan's. Dan is much more experimental. He's really interested in theory. He's really interested in technique and he's super interested in pushing himself to the endless borders of his playing, you know, kind of knowledge and ability. I've gone, yeah, I don't like it over there too much. It's a bit uncomfortable. I just rather stay here where I can, you know, I can be in a, a more comfortable place and you get criticized for that. People like going, get out of your comfort zone. I'm like, no, I like my comfort zone. <laughs> Don't, no one ever told Albert King to get out of his comfort zone or st not that I'm comparing myself to Albert King, but no one ever told, you know, Lucather to get out of his comfort zone. It's like, no, 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 that you do what you do and, and that's okay. I, I'm not going to be Wayne Krantz. It's just not going to happen. Right. There's something to be applauded about that though. Like you, if you find your lane, man, you know, yeah. Um, you know what I find interesting about the whole YouTube world, and you've been doing this a lot longer than I have and a way bigger audience than I have, but like it is like my friend Jeremy's in here and he was like, what's the uh, the best worst comment y'all have received? <laughs> like, do you remember something that you just like saw and you just like laughed out loud? Like, what? Who says that? Like, there have been so many and they, they start off, some of them are just deeply hurtful. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. uh, he's got a face I'd like to punch, you know, stuff like that. And it's like, well, that's helpful, isn't it? That's helpful. Um, some of them, are, 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 um, the, it used to really annoy me, actually. And uh, we talked about mental health quite a bit on that pedal show. And I've talked a bit about mental health because I had a really rough patch um, for a while there. And, and that was certainly driven by getting too into worrying about what people think about you. You know, it's pretty common among people like us common among musicians i think oh, yeah. and i just got i got a little out of whack with it and, and done a lot of work on trying to understand that over the years so the kind of comments that would really upset me a little while ago are the ones that i now read and go actually i i i don't i feel a bit sorry for you because it what it does it displays a lot of anger and right hurt on the part of the person who's writing the comment and it also displays a massive gigantic lack of empathy to the point where they're probably going somebody please notice me right you know here we are on the other side of the lens ostensibly having a whale of a time you know it was the best job in the world and all that and don't get me wrong it's pretty cool um and i think there's a bit there can be some jealousy there can be some hurt there can be some anger and there's a lot of people who just don't get heard don't get mm. heard, don't get listened to, don't get recognized. And I think a lot of the negativity, I mean, all right, yes, you do get some super nasty trollers. And thankfully, we don't get too many of those. In fact, we don't really get any of those anymore. But I think for a lot of people, it's just this sort of inner sadness that's going, somebody please notice me and I need to be ever more unpleasant in order for people to notice me. So um, that's the serious part of the answer. Um, one of my favorite comments this week was... Um, <laughs> will Andy Timmons be playing the whole three hours or do we have to sit through that pedal show band? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah. That's gotta just make you laugh. I mean, come on, dude. Like, uh, who's, I mean, dude, come what's, on. What's, the, what's your favorite one? Uh, dude, I had, I haven't had that many, but I, the one I had the one time my, I told my wife and she was cracking up because so I, I'm a big Marvel nerd. So I have some pop yeah. Funkos behind me, like whatever. Actually, the middle section right here, that's Pearl Jam. I kept it in the box. I got to keep them in the box, Nick. Um, but somebody wrote like, look at this guy playing in his basement 
uh, with a bunch of toys behind him. Like this, you know, 40, whatever he said. Now he's like, this, you're 35 years old living in your parents' basement, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And my wife was like, first of all, it's hilarious because you're in your 40s. So just take it as a compliment. <laughs> like, <laughs> jokes on you, brother. I'm in my 40s. But, um, but yeah, it's just like stuff like you said. And I've wrestled too a lot in the past couple of years with mental health and like yeah. trying to get in a better place and, and be happy and love my life. You know what I mean? And that's hard for a lot of people. And, and it's good work to put in, you know, um, yeah. for the future yeah. of your existence on this planet. But yeah, um, it's, yeah. it's work, that's for sure. Oh, God, yeah. Um, well, let me, I want to ask you, I have so many questions for you. And I knew we weren't going to get to all these. But so when you, when you're going through high school, I'm sure you played in bands in high school and played with other people. And what, so first of all, what was your first band's name? Um, uh, ooh. Uh, it became above and beyond. Okay. But I, there must have been something before that. Because I God. started playing out pretty early. I think I did my first gigs age 13 or 14. And and that band quickly became above and beyond. And I can't remember if we were called something else before that. Uh... It's one for the remember. archives. I it's okay. Remember. I want to say I want to say it was called Masquerade. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was your rig? What were you playing through at thirteen or fourteen, like with with your friends? Um, I had, let's see, I had my dad got me by that time a Columbus was the brand um, Strat copy. Okay, I think was the first guitar, and to play in the band, my brother basically twisted the aforementioned kevin smith's arm to sell this yamaha 50 watt solid state combo because mm -hmm. the aforementioned kevin smith with the aforementioned 80s fender strat had just bought a marshall stack and if you thought a strat was cool in a small village in dorset in england in the early 1980s a marshall stack was off the scale it was like oh my god it may as well be the pyramids so Kevin's amp that he didn't really want to sell, my brother sort of, well, <laughs> persuaded him <laughs> to sell it. And so that's what it was. It was a Columbus Strat copy and this uh, 50 watt Yamaha amp. And then pretty quickly, pretty quickly, that then became a 70s silver face twin. I mean, I think I had a 70s silver face twin at 14 years old. Dang. So, yeah, yeah. Were, were you allowed. running... Uh, yeah, I was going to say, were you running all four power tubes or did you pull two out to not get no, in half? I, I wouldn't have understood anything like that then. I just, right. I remember, I distinctly remember getting it. I might have been just 15. I might have been just 15, but I distinctly remember getting it and plugging it in and turning it up to 10, plugging my Strat in and going, wow, this doesn't sound like Stevie Ray Vaughan at all. Because <laughs> all, all yeah. I knew was that Stevie Ray used a Fender amp. So I thought, well, it's obviously any Fender amp and um, the rest is just detail. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, dude. And that amp, I had a 1971 silver panel twin. It sounded great. It's just like, you know, if you want the headroom, it's a great oh. amp. Like, but talk about heavy, man. And as a young kid, did it was it on casters or anything? Yeah, but we didn't worry about any of that. We were we were <laughs> we were pretty rock and roll from the get go, actually, and we had our own PA made. And um, I think the the other guys in the band were two years older than me. In fact, it's one of the uh, Paul, the bass player, is his fiftieth birthday today. So how cool! Oh, is that? nice. That's awesome. And uh, um, yeah, and we uh, I don't know if I'm misremembering it, but pretty soon we we had a van. As soon as that anyone was old enough to have a driving license, we had a van and we were doing like, I don't know, three, four, sometimes five nights a week. Weirdly, I did a gig on the Dorset coast this weekend, just two weekends ago, actually. And I bumped into our old trumpet player, a guy called Matthew Barge, Matt Barge. And Matt said, do you remember that weekend we did five, five gigs in two days? I was like, how did we do five gigs in two days? He said, well, we did two afternoon shows and we did a breakfast show. So how did, what, did, what did we do a breakfast show? And he's like, well, apparently it was some young farmers do. And when they all wake up drunk, they want to hear a live band. And so, <laughs> I anyway, love that. That's anyway. awesome. 
yeah, yeah. So you could, so it was a bit of a weird one because there I am, like 14, 15, 16, doing all these gigs and you know having a couple of drinks and um, not really caring about my schoolwork and all of that. And uh, and it was just a, an odd adolescence, I suppose, in that in that respect because you're you're around adults all the time you're dealing with people that are older than you you're dealing with getting paid you're doing all this stuff and it was just yeah looking back on it, it was weird and of course i had because i didn't have to pay any rent i didn't have a car had no bills i was loaded because <laughs> you, yeah. <laughs> you might get 50 quid you know and so i just i had this spare cash which i managed to spend somehow on guitars and amps and pedals and stuff but um yeah, yeah it was a really weird early adolescence i suppose what do you think you would tell your younger self at that time if since you were flush with cash if you could go back and talk to <laughs> young mick like at that time what are would you, you say are you kidding um <laughs> i mean definitely try and learn how to play the guitar properly that would have been all these people around you you can learn something from them so stop being an asshole and and you know, and actually learn something from them. That would be number one. Number two, um, buy some vintage guitars. <laughs> At that time? Oh my gosh, dude. Oh, yeah. Man, you'd yeah, be cleaning it, up. It's so did you, after that, Mick, like after like high school and stuff, like, so did you go to university and study like journalism and communications and stuff? Like, how did you end up getting into Guitarist Magazine and stuff? I, I, I stumbled into journalism um, in that, so around about that time it, here in the UK, we do something called A-levels, which is what happens 17, 18. And that's your sort of pre, uh, you, you know, bachelor's degree exams. And my friends were all getting signed and going off in bands and stuff. And I was like, I don't want to do that because a lot of my other friends were getting signed in bands and getting dropped. And it just looked a bit gruesome, you know, and I didn't, I just didn't, feel like a i was good enough or b that i had the sort of creative interest enough to write songs and, and go that route so i said i'm going to university my dad was like confused he's like why are you doing that you know you should play the guitar that's your thing i'm like well nah i don't i don't want to do that i'm gonna go and go to university so I went to university um and i went to university because everyone else went to university i had no great i was the first person in my extended family to go to university um and I just went because I went to a good school. And when you when you turned up on day one, they said, when you go to university, they didn't say if you go to university, it was right. like it was a foregone conclusion. So they spit you out the other end. You end up filling in the UCAS forms and um, off you go. I eventually ended up at Bath um, at the because uh, I only did, I only only did I only ended up doing two A-levels, French and geography. Oh, <laughs> and interesting. I think I managed to, to, no, I didn't. I dropped French. I did economics and geography. That's what it was. And, uh, and I dropped French cause I was on tour <laughs> <laughs> and I say on tour on tour of German, uh, sorry, American and British army bases in Germany. That's so, cool. It was pretty cool, but it was, you know, <laughs> I, I remember that one of the gigs on that tour, our first song was voodoo child <laughs> and they were expecting push it by salt and pepper. <laughs> We honestly, we arrived and the promoter goes, "Where's your girl singer?" Uh, and we're like, "We don't, we don't have a girl singer." And he says, "He and he says you do." He gets the picture out, <laughs> and our lead singer Alistair had long hair. Oh man! <laughs> He's like, "There she is, <laughs> mate. You need glasses." Anyway, so we go around all these German army base, uh, in British army bases in Germany, getting the almost getting the crap kicked out of us every night because the last thing they wanted was a bunch of long hairs playing rock music you know they wanted pop band anyway uh, i digress um i ended up at bath um and i didn't really know what i wanted to do so i did a, a social sciences degree which was economic sociology psychology philosophy in the first year and then you um you you specialize and when once i specialized i did a, a lot of theoretical media studies so mass communication stuff, which I found super interesting. I was never interested in academics before that, but I just somehow, it, it just completely grabbed me hold. And I ended up getting the highest mark in my year. And I was, I'd never been academic before that. So that, that lit me up for that. And I think it put me in the mode of 
thinking about mass communications and thinking about you know lining up for potential journalism as it happened as i graduated uh there was a big publishing company in bath called future publishing and they did stuff like computer magazines and pc gamer and all that kind of stuff anyway they bought a, a suite of magazines which included guitarists guitar techniques rhythm keyboard review and something else uh and i was a guitar massive guitarist reader massive fan of it so i literally went and knocked on the door and said have you got any jobs and they said that's not really how it works um, <laughs> and i said well why not <laughs> and i ended up getting an interview and ended up getting a job and literally just stumbled into it so i think i always feel a bit of a cheat when i call it journalism because it's not really journalism it was sort of guitar enthusiasm that you write about <laughs> right <laughs> Um, I, I mean, how much did you learn on that? I mean, was it like a crash course for you, like in working in that industry? And did yeah, you... yeah, because I, yeah. I was straight out of uni, so I didn't know anything about anything. So they taught me how to write. They taught me how to sub. They taught me how to run magazines, which the thing I'd got hired for was they were really short of people to run magazines, like, you know, uh, manage the production schedules and get the copy in and make sure it all goes through on the page and get the film off to the printers and all of that, you know. Bear in mind that when I joined magazines, we were still shooting on film for uh, pictures and the magazines were still printed on four color plates that had to go off to a physical printer. You know, there was no digital camera and there was no um, PDF. So it was quite a manual process. Um, and they wanted people to just make sure, because obviously if you're, if you're booking a print slot for 100,000 magazines or in Future's case, 3 million magazines, um across various printers then if you don't hit those print slots the fines are unbelievable and then that that went on to um you know if you don't meet your four minute unload time at tesco or whatever then you get fined massively so the magazine actually going out the door on time was um, almost more important than what was in the magazine itself so Man. um anyway that's that's how i fell into that and i was lucky that i met a guy called Neville Martin and Neville is remains one of my closest friends to this day, 25 years later. Um, and he was the editor and he was just super passionate about guitar and me and him just hit it off. And he liked me because in this massive corporate world that he just moved into, he found someone that actually gave a crap about guitars, which not very many people there did. Um, and, and it, it was thanks to Nev really that I managed to get on and, and, you know, move up as it were. And then, so how has that, I'm sure that has spilled into your experience in helping you, you guys get the uh, pedal show off the ground. Like how much of that experience aided you, you know, when you kind of decided to full force, you guys were going hundred percent in on it. Yeah. I mean, it was everything really, because on the one hand it, it you know, at the time, so I, I went from production assistant I became deputy editor, I, you know, I was, I don't know, a couple of other jobs in between that, ended up deputy editor on guitarist, and then there was nowhere to go, never wasn't going anywhere. So I went off to a competitor and helped them launch a competitive magazine, but in the knowledge that I'd always said to whoever was managing guitarists, look, if, as and when the job ever comes up, I really want that job, it's, it's the only job I want, and if it ever comes up, I'd love you to interview me for it. Anyway, it came up and I got it. So I went back to Future after five years as editor of Guitarist and ended up editor in chief of Guitarist, Total Guitar and Guitar Techniques. Um, and sort of by doing that, A, you meet everybody. So from, you know, Paul Reed Smith to, well, you just meet everybody because yeah. you go to every NAM show, you go to every product launch, you go to every big law you know you just meet everybody and you meet lots of artists too so industry wise you you meet a lot of people but also as much as anything else future were absolutely astonishingly brilliant at making magazines i mean they were off the scale good professionalism on a level that certainly i've had never known or never seen anywhere else and that kind of you know i can remember in my first subbing lessons learning how to sub copy back in the days before we were too worried about environmentalism um my my sub editor i she'd get the copy and i'd i'd mark it up in pen and she would then read it 
print it out, mark it up in pen again, throw it in the bin after I'd looked at it, do it again. And we'd go around that nine or 10 times so that it was right first time. And that's, that's where we got to on the magazines, you know, the production process, just so slick and so professional. And for that, I am eternally grateful to the discipline of production because that spills over directly into what we do here in that we just couldn't do it if we weren't efficient. It, it would, it would simply not work. And I'm not saying we have the efficiency of a, a massive corporation, but learning how to manage process aside from everything else in that job, I'm, I'm just endlessly grateful for because it is process. You know, yeah. when you're dealing with a terabytes worth of data for a day, you need a process to manage that. You know, when you're dealing with audio production, when you're dealing with all this stuff that we deal with, if, if you're not organized, it doesn't go out on Friday. And so I'm really grateful for that. And, but what really cinched it was guitarist was early to the video game and you know, it's laughable to watch them now, but you need to put it in context because, again, shooting on film. Um, you know, the available technology then was just, it, it was nothing like it is today. You could not get this quality of picture out of a camera that cost less than 20,000 quid. Right. So Guitarist was early to the video game and it was all very kind of, Good afternoon and welcome to <laughs> Guitarist Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> and looking back on it, it's hilarious. But actually, they did make some early wins in 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 the sort of you know guitar demonstration thing. Anyway, we went on and on and on with that. And I was I'd got massively interested in video to the point where I bought my own camera, my own audio gear, and thanks to a guy called Martin Holmes who shot all the guitarist video, he helped me to learn how to use a camera and um i just became more interested in that than i did anything else that we were doing it was video that because th this goes hand in hand with a slow tailing off of print sales mm -hmm. and no matter no matter what we did and the company had this great big other arm called music radar which was pumping loads of money into and with respect was it just wasn't very good while cash cowing the magazines to take all the profit out of them to pay them to do that. And that was quite dispiriting. Whereas I was jumping up and down, come on, let's do more video, let's do more video. And they were like, well, it's too expensive. Right. <laughs> so, so I just started making video and making video and making video. And then for a bunch of other reasons, I just, I'd had enough of the corporate thing. And um, I was very, I was making myself quite unpopular because I'd say lots of unpopular things right. <laughs> um, in a corporate scenario. And uh, so I just thought, I'm done, I'm out, I'm gone. And I said yeah. to my my wife, I, I want to run my own business by the time I'm 40. So that's what we did. And I set up on my own and started doing video stuff. And that became the nucleus of that pedal show because I started doing some work with Dan. Man. That's amazing, dude. I just, I have my hair standing up on my arm, man. Oh, That's sorry. I, I, talk, I talk a lot. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. I know we're, and we're almost out of time. Um, oh, no. I, I Let's just, keep going know. forever. All I'm right. Talk about me. Let's talk more about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, so let me switch to some, some guitar related stuff real quick and see, you know, if you're, if you're willing to go an extra 10 minutes or something, oh, man. I'll, ke I'll keep it wrapped in. I'll keep it wrapped I'm in. I'm all yours. I want to know. I want to know what you think your your biggest strength is on the instrument. Uh, I have a note. Okay. Um, that means uh, 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 an old compadre, Phil Hilborn, who's an uh, utterly astonishing player, and he was the music editor on Guitarist. And if he saw someone that could play, he would say, he's got a note. I and it that. means it do doesn't really matter what you play. It means that the note you play connects with humans. Yeah. And even if I can only play one note, I, I am very fortunate that I have some semblance of that. Oh yeah, you do, you do. So on the flip side, the antithesis, what's your biggest weakness on the instrument? Uh, harmonic um, idiocy. So I've just started doing guitar lessons. I've met this great guy called Chris, who I ended up doing a blind gig with. And um, Chris was on the gig and we just hit it off immediately. He's massively into strats. He really knows his stuff. Um, and actually, he wants to do some of his education stuff 
on YouTube. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll trade you some YouTube knowledge and some filming knowledge for some guitar lessons. And we've gone back to step one. He's got me doing cycle of fourths on single notes. So I learn the fretboard. When I know the fretboard, we can move forward. So it's that. It's harmonic. I just, I just don't know enough about harmonic knowledge of the guitar. Yeah. I, I love <laughs> the video you guys did on Joey's birthday when you guys are like, blam, 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 blam. <laughs> just because he's such a monster with harmonic knowledge. He and Ariel, by the way. So like, yeah, I yeah, just, yeah. I just went to see Ariel and maybe it was like a month ago. He was, he came through Washington DC, which is like an hour and a half from me. So I made the trek down. Awesome. And like, I've seen, you know, I've, I've listened to his music for years. I've done some lessons with him. I had him on the show. So I know him decently. Um, but just to see him live yeah, and man. like how he like constructs, he reminds me of Bruce Hornsby. Like Bruce Hornsby ah. can sit at a piano and harmonically compose improvisationally. Ariel is the same way, but with the guitar yeah. and Joey too. Joey too. Yeah. Yeah. But Joey, watching them, you know, it is, it, it's mind blowing. I've been lucky enough to have some lessons from Joey as well. Cause when he comes here and when they tour here, he stays with us and they, they base themselves here and rehearse here and stuff. So we're very, very blessed with that. I asked him to chart out a Ray Charles song for me, for me. Cause I couldn't work out the chords. We're going to, we're doing a Ray Charles song in the, in the set next week. And he's like, Oh yeah. Do you want me to talk you through this? And uh, he sends me through the chart. He goes, hang on, let me just do the chart. <laughs> Emails it through. And his start point for how to understand it was so far ahead of anything I understand. And we, you know, we, 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 we unpicked it and he helped me understand it. And it's like, wow, it's just, it's phenomenal what yeah. those guys know. And I don't, I, you know, I don't suppose, and I don't actually want to get there. What I want to be able to do is play all my majors, minors, major sevenths and minor sevenths the associated arpeggios and string that together in some sort of musical <laughs> form <laughs> so that I can play the changes. That's, that's what I would like to be able to do is to be able to play changes, not in a stilted way, but in a kind of, in a way that is harmonically uh, useful. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting too, because when you talk about, when you're talking about harmony and like breaking things down, like you're like a, like a Ray tune or something. I, so I studied with Joey too a bunch because I, I play in open C. I was in open E and he's like, you should try this. You should totally try this. <laughs> so like I, and now I'm just hooked and I do it all the time. But yeah. he, one time I was playing in a, um, like a jazz fusion trio in Baltimore here. And this, this awesome club, this vaunted venue in Baltimore that it's a hole in the wall, but people, it's like the 55 bar in New York kind of thing, but it's in Baltimore. Yeah. And I remember talking to him because we were playing all this really heady stuff. And I was like, dude, we're playing um, Teen Town in, into Dean Town, the Wolfpack tune. <laughs> and he was like, I was like, I don't really know how to approach soloing over those changes. And he, and I remember what he said to me. He was like, dude, you're complicating it. Yeah. Just start with the triad. Start yeah. with the triad. And that was so revelatory for me as a guitarist to be like, oh, yeah. I mean, everything starts with that, right? Like yeah, all, yeah, yeah. all the tensions, we can we can push those tensions in and all the passing tones and stuff. But like when you really think about it, like if you start with the triad, you can't go wrong. Like it's and then, just, you know, once you see the triad, you see the extensions. And that's the that's the the bit that sort of marries together a fretboard knowledge, knowing where the notes are, but chiefly knowing where your root notes are, I think is probably where it begins. And then you can put together your triads and then you can put together fragments of arpeggios and then you have melody. And then instead of it being this shape, this shape, this shape, and this shape, you've got this shape. Yeah. And that's your box. Your box is those 21 frets, not these f three or those five. And the work I've been doing most recently is to just unblock the minor pentatonic, which, you know, I, li I like, I, th I like that sound. And all of a sudden it's not position one, three four and five which are the ones i normally play it's it doesn't matter it's it's one position yeah yeah that's, yeah that's the goal anyway it, it really and like i have to give a big shout out to our mutual friend bv who is doing moderation here for me as well um BV. and uh but the yeah i mean i think inversions as well i mean it's yeah. it, it's the map of the fretboard man like if there's anything that i learned at 
Berkeley that really opened up my fretboard was you got to know all your all your triads and all the inversions of those triads across and up and down your fretboard. If yeah, you do yeah. if you do that, you will get to know intimately your fretboard, which yeah. I think a lot of people take for granted, you know, because yeah, triads I, are simple. I don't even know if I'm going to get there, but that I I 100% agree with you and it's it annoys me greatly where I see all these educators on YouTube who advertise on various channels including ours going hey don't do all that work this is easy and i'm like no it's not mm -mm. there is no easy way to learn how to play the guitar if you want to play the guitar properly it's hard and it's going to take you forever so stop telling me it's easy because it's not easy and any anything you do to get around it is a cheat so i'm not i'm not a huge fan of that i start to sound like steve lukather <laughs> <laughs> there's no shortcuts man there really isn't there are, like, no, there are none you know not it's not to do it properly no. And I, I think if there's anything I've often thought about that, have you thought about that too? When you go to teach a young student or somebody that's, you know, a, a new player, it's like, what would I have taught my younger self to help me move along a little quicker? There's things like that, but there's no shortcuts, you know, uh, and it's really based on the student too and how they learn to yeah, make it yeah. enjoyable for them. You know, well, it, it's that so. you've got to have, you've got to have enough balance of homework and fun, haven't you? And I think yeah. when that balance gets out of whack in either direction, there's no progress. No, um, no, not at all. And, uh, and that whole idea of running up and down scales is, is, oh man. I know that it's brutal. Feel, yeah. 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 I, there's I gotta be, a, <laughs> yeah, there's gotta be a way to like make those things musical you know yeah. to keep people interested so yeah i um, always think context if you can get context then you you will get progress but oh my god yeah 100 <laughs> percent. um i wanted to ask you to like i did a video a while ago on this on my channel but why do you think we all keep buying pedals and not practicing <laughs> <laughs> um well because i probably agree with you put it that way yeah i think I don't wish to be a sexist about it, but there, there are, there's a very common thread running through males and acquisition syndrome, be it <laughs> golf clubs or cycling things and guitars or cars or whatever it is. And ladies, I apologize. Uh, and I'm sure there's plenty of ladies out there too, women who are into acquiring things, but I think it is in my world anyway, you know, love it loathe it or otherwise our youtube world is 98 percent male it just is they're the same stats and i know female youtubers for whom the stats are the same it's still very male despite mm -hmm. everyone's efforts so taking that as read i actually think it, it might even be a bit of the thrill of the chase where you live vicariously through the things that you may want to do and we all have a vision of ourselves being Angus Young, right? Or <laughs> Richie Blackmore or Hendrix or whoever it is. And, and you can spend a great deal of psychological time imagining that if you amass all this stuff, you're going to be that. The drop comes when you realize it doesn't work that way. And that's a difficult time. And I think that's where some people fall out of playing. And other people realize they just got to pair it back. And I think all of us go through those times of, I don't want any pedals. Now I want the biggest board in the world. And it's just yeah. cyclical. Yeah. And you, if you take a snapshot in history, that's the thing. Like you make a video and you put it on the internet. Everyone thinks this is the truth forever. And it's like, no, it probably changed tomorrow. And that's cool. We've got to be open to change. And I think, but I'm the same, you know, my friend Chris is going to teach me guitar. He came in and he said, have you heard this yet? It was the J rocket Lenny pedal. I'm like, Hmm, I heard it in Nam once, but, I can't, I just can't buy anything that's like trades off Stevie Ray's name. It's just not, it's just not cool. I can't do that. I can steal all his licks and try and beat him and <laughs> right. try and embody, embody him. But buying stuff that, you know, I don't, I'm just not cool with that. Anyway, plugged it in. I'm like, I have to have one of these. <laughs> I've got over a hundred overdrive pedals or certainly over 50 anyway. And there's probably 300 in here. So it's not like I don't have an alternative. So I'm, I'm as guilty of it as anyone else, but I think it is vicarious acquisition acquisition syndrome which leads to the dream of doing something that you might one day do i think that's what it is yeah yeah i mean i i would 100 percent agree with you and i also think man it's fun isn't that what we got into this for the first time for you know like yeah. and i think there's a lot of people who whatever makes you pick up the instrument i think is a good thing regardless if it's a pedal or if it's a new pack of strings or whatever i think man it's 
And that's what's so great about the show, like what you guys do is that it's it's educational first and foremost for all of us. But it's kind of like what you said. It's like you kind of have to accept your neuroses in terms of <laughs> I like this stuff. It makes me happy. And and that's, yeah. you know, we're here on this earth for a very short period of time. And I, I'm like, dude, do you, man? Like if you yeah. want every every freaking overdrive pedal on planet Earth. Yeah. Do it. Do it. Do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and don't. I don't be angry about someone else who doesn't want that or wants a different thing. Like, right. That's that I, I'm always consistently amazed how many people are sort of trying to defend their own choices and goodness knows I've done enough of that over my time, but I am completely over it now. <laughs> it's like, you don't yeah. have to defend anything. You just need to do what you want to do. And, and the, the, the central point of that pedal show is to go, there is no best. Right. There are no answers, only better questions. And it's totally okay to like what you like and just do what you want to do because you will end up happier that way. So stop sweating it, play the guitar, do what you want to do. And that's, I guess that's the fundamental reason we started doing it. Yeah. Well, it comes across that way too, man. I think that's the thing that you may not get daily affirmations about, but like it's, it's fun to be a viewer. It's, like I said, it's educational and and I think it's there's a, there's a there's a part of of me that has you know this this yearning to be educated about new things to to learn about like things that I don't understand that I I could feel as a guitarist and as a musician as a songwriter what you're kind of expressing and what you guys are talking about is aiding me in my quest you know so like what you do is is create a huge public service to us <laughs> as guitarists and you know I, it's just I, there's so many people in the chat here too that have been like just saying like you know you guys I, I can't express to you how much you know i love the show and and all that and and there's a lot of people who you know while you're kind of watching you guys videos i mean there's humor i am a yeah. stick i'm a i love humor you guys <laughs> you guys go there um I, you know and, and there's there's just like it's guitar so we love hearing new yeah. things the first time you guys did the automaton and the tomato yeah, tone, yeah. tomato tone, yeah. I uh, I I saw it because I was really curious about it, and I was like, this could be a thing that could replace all other things on my board. Like, I don't need all the all the overdrives. Yeah. Like, maybe yeah. get a MIDI switcher and, and I'd be set. And I finally did it. Like, did you? Yeah, I've I've had the automaton for a couple years, Mick, but I haven't had it on my board. And I finally slapped some Velcro on it. And I sold a bunch of my overdrive pedals because I'm no way. I ordered a Josh Williams Mockingbird. Oh, what color? What so, color? Dude, it's gonna be so sexy. It's um, it's got tortoise shell binding and it's charcoal frost, like that deep oh, gray. It's kidding? gonna be dope, dude. <laughs> I'm that so is excited. Such a great color. Oh, oh it's man, gonna be good. That, that's I love his guitars. They are magic things. How, how many of you play? I haven't played any. I'm just kind of going off of. Uh, I don't know, four or five at Nam shows and stuff. Ariel had one. Uh, I think Joey had one for a minute. Um, and then Nam shows and stuff. So yeah. Yeah, they. I mean, they seem like amazing guitars. And I had Josh on about a month ago, and uh, I was just like, I just want to also support this guy too. Yeah. You know, like as a small business, it's just like he's making amazing things. But um, it's crazy. Too cool. Yeah, man. <laughs> All right. So I think that's a good time to, to bounce out and do our lightning round get down. Are you ready for this, Mick? Oh, yeah, I think I am. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pull up a metronome here. Uh, first of all, thank you again for doing the show. Here's lightning round get down. All right. Uh, pull up a metronome. We're going to go. We're going to go about. 112 on the BPM just to, you know, you know, if you want to have a little bit of suspense, it'll work that way. I'm going to ask you t uh, 10 questions. This or that type of thing. If you want, you can explain your answers. You don't have to. You can just burn right through them if you want. The first one is always the same. Lennon or McCartney? Lennon. Single coils or PAFs? Oh, single coils, unfortunately, having just got some of the best PAFs I've ever heard, but single coils. <laughs> All right. Uh, Roadrunner or Wiley Coyote? Which team are you going to be on? Wiley Coyote. <laughs> Roadrunner's kind of a dick, isn't he? Um, uh, just, 
I yeah. just not. Yeah. Anyway, I, I always felt I felt for the coyote. He was just he was he was a loser, wasn't he? Bless him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, tacos or burrito? Oh, burrito, definitely. Okay. Uh, and yeah, if yeah, you just had more to... substantial. Yeah, yum, yum, yum. Uh, yeah. All right, so if you had to choose between these two, which if for, for one guitar for the rest of your life, would you choose blue or would you choose your 335? Uh, 335. Wow. I was not yeah, expecting yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, having just okay. recently fall, fallen out of love with blue, so. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I've got an old one, haven't I? So you do. changed everything. Yeah. That did change everything. Uh, beer or wine? Wine. Wine. Um, uh, beer makes me depressed. True story. Um, but I love wine. I love wine. It's pretty good. Nectar of the gods. Uh, superhero powers. Telekinesis or super strength? I don't know what telekinesis is. is it Moving things with your thought? mind. Moving. Oh, uh, no, no, no. That wouldn't. I can't. I have to move things with my hands because I'm a, a, ever so slightly funny about that uh so super strength yeah of course because then all i right, could cool. i could have more evs in my life <laughs> <laughs> all right uh favorite chord between these two if you're gonna you're gonna rock one dominant seven or 13 uh yeah gotta be dominant seven because you just use it more okay uh tuners clip on or floor clip on tuner it's the work of the devil. And no, one allowed, <laughs> no one should be allowed one. Floor oh. tuner. They should be banned. They should be smashed. They should be thrown into bins everywhere. <laughs> Except to open mic nights where they should be mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> that, that audience is so split on the clip-on tuner. It's so split. People either like hate on it. They're like, hey, man, I have more room on my pedal board if I have that on my headstock. So. I'd, rather, I'd rather have no tuner than... than I'd rather tune by ear than have that thing stuck to. I mean, if you do it where no one can see, fine, but don't have it on there. Just don't have it on there. <laughs> All right, and here's the last one, Mick. Sometimes this is the hardest one. Sometimes this is the easiest for people. If you can take one record, it does not have to be your favorite record of all time, but one record and erase it from your memory like you've never heard it before, just so you can go back and listen to it for the first time again and experience it, what record would that be? uh what's going on by marvin gay really i haven't heard that one in almost 100 episodes no one said that so tell me more i just think it's an astonishing piece of work i think it is an utterly astonishing piece of work obviously it's him singing but i think it's him at a particular point where he was you know talking about environmentalism talking about you know the oppression of certain peoples talking about joblessness talking about you know what's going on it, it, and while i can't relate to that in a personal sense because i've grown up comfortably in the 80s and 90s um it's just an astonishing piece of work jameson on bass you know it's just it makes me yeah it not very many months go by when i don't spin that record at least once awesome awesome dude well mick Man, I so so appreciate you taking a couple, like taking an hour to hang out with me. The, Are you the, kidding? It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Mark. That's considering and, all the people that have been on, <laughs> it's a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, it's it's growing. It's crazy. I got Robert Keeley's on next week, and then we're out, and then I'm gonna take a couple months off and enjoy the summer. We'll come back, but uh, I really appreciate you being part of the history and and both you guys. So uh, you know, tell Dan again, thank you for when he was on. Uh, anything else you, you have going on? Like, do you want to drop to the peoples? Are there any uh, uh, any music or anything coming out fun? Uh, not really. We've got these gigs with Andy Timmons that are happening Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. I think they're all pretty much sold out, um, which is occupying all of my brain at this point. Uh, we've got a fairly eclectic set list that includes Peg by Steely Dan, uh, Everybody Wants to Rule the World by Tears for Fears, uh, Owner of a Lonely Heart by Yes, um, a Ray Charles tune, Drown in My Own Tears, which is how mm. I feel about right now. Uh, and some other stuff. And it's quite an ambitious set for us, given that, well, not for Dan, but for me, it's pretty ambitious. So I never play that many chords. Yeah. So um, we're really looking forward to it. Uh, the band's killer. Dougie on drums, Paddy on bass, um, Jack on keys, which is like, yes, yeah. man. 
He's amazing. So, uh, Jack from Andertons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude, yeah. He's a big, isn't he a big uh, Hornsby guy? I think he loves, I think he's a huge Hornsby fan from what I Jack remember. Jack Duxbury, uh, the, his name is Jack Duxbury, and he's just, I mean, I don't know this about Jack. It wouldn't surprise me if he's some kind of polymath. His 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 knowledge of music and his knowledge of harmony and his ability to play is stunning. It's, it's, it's awe-inspiring how good he is. And so when you're doing something like Owner of a Lonely Heart and he drops all the synth parts in, or um, like he'll have sampled. I mean, this probably doesn't sound that impressive to keyboard players, but to guitar players, it's like magic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all of a sudden you hear this thing underneath and it's like, oh my God, because I've never really played in bands with keyboard players. I always thought they were kind of spawn of the devils because they have to sit down. Like apart from drums, nothing is cool when you sit down. You need to stand up. <laughs> right. But then if you have to stand up with one of those damn keytars, no. Sit, sit back down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no. Anyway, Jack has changed my mind on keyboard players, and I now can't imagine being in a band without a keyboard player. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, we're doing that. Um, what else? Um, yeah, just, just moving on, really. I, it, it's a an endless learning episode is what TPS is, and Dan and I are always trying to find ways to make it fun for ourselves but also more engaging for everyone else we're doing more stuff in person so we do live days here where a few people can come in and experience things firsthand and then more gigs and stuff like that because i think one thing we both feel quite passionately about is that rock and roll is getting steamrolled over by the convenience crowd and i'm really bored of it so we want people to hear loud guitar amps we want people to hear feel a drum kit hit them in the chest not literally you know with sound waves right <laughs> <laughs> i think we've all heard a drum kit falling down the stairs on quite a few fills but um yeah so yeah we, i think um as much as big youtube numbers are brilliant and we love it and goodness knows we're not big compared to retchel and the the really big guys but um rick beato for god's sake oh my god um, yeah so we we feel that maybe we can be more use actually engaging with humans in a direct face-to-face -face kind of way so we want to do more of that that's that's the that's where my head is at that at the moment i like meeting humans and watching their faces when they hear 100 watt marshall for the first time it's a it's a pleasant experience yeah man that's so awesome well i <laughs> applaud that idea and i can't wait to see more of it on the channel but again mick thank you so much buddy you can hang tight uh everybody thanks for for stopping in for commenting for saying hello BV, thank, thank you. you again, and uh, take care of yourself. Take care of each other. We'll see you next time.